6.30, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, um, Psalm, Psalm 66 is we're going to be tonight. Appreciate Matt filling in last week. Um, and I'm excited to be, be back. I missed y'all, missed, missed praising, praising the Lord with you on Wednesday as we, as we study the Psalms. Um, <clears throat> this is going to be uh, Psalm 66. I was, I was saying before, I, I, I went, to, uh, went to sleep about 4.15 this morning, which I really don't do very often. Normally I'm pretty good at going to bed at normal hours and getting up. I normally get my sleep, so uh, I only had a couple hours last night and then a nap this afternoon, so we'll, we'll see. I might be a little bit more scattered if, if, that, can even be, if that can even happen, but let's, let's pray as we, as we begin this evening. Lord God, we're here not because, um, not for any other reason than we want to hear from you. And Lord, for many years we've gathered on Wednesdays as a time of prayer to commit ourselves to praying for each other and for our nation and for your glory. And I pray as we study this psalm that this would be um, a reminder to us of the prayers we need to be praying and a reminder of who it is we pray to. I pray that you would be the one who teaches tonight, that your spirit would be among us. Lord, we know that nothing good comes except from you. We ask you, Lord, to, to help us tonight, to teach us, to conform us into your image, to glorify your name in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Psalm 66, and uh, I won't say all the details, but I just, this has been, last 24 hours has been a little bit of a frustrating time for me. Um, and when it comes time, and on, on um, Wednesday mornings when I read the psalms for the day, the three psalms, uh, it's always um, a, a surprise, I guess, about what they're going to be. And, you know, the psalms can range all over the place as far as what they're talking about. And this was one that was really encouraging to me. I, it's, it's amazing to me how the Lord works um, in, in my life, and I'm sure he does in yours as well, that when we're discouraged or when we're frustrated or when we're tired or whatever it is, it seems like it's in those times that the Lord really speaks comfort into us. Um, and, and I felt like that was true of this psalm. So, um, so this is one I'm excited about. It's broken into four sections. If you look at Psalm 66, at the end of verse 4, we see that word that we've been seeing a lot as we've studied psalm. There's that pause, Selah. And then again after verse 7, and then again after verse 15, and then the last part of the psalm. So four Four sections. I'm going to read the whole psalm, and then we'll go back and talk about the individual parts of it. Psalm 66, to the choir master, a song, a psalm. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Come and see what God has done. He is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man. He turned the sea into dry land. They passed through the river on foot. There did we rejoice in him who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, um, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you. That which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble, I will offer to you burnt offerings of fattened animals. And with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and goats. 
Come and hear all you who fear the Lord, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but truly God has listened. He has attended to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love for me, from me. Just real quick before we walk through all of it, um, if you look at the very first verse, praises do you, O God. So David is saying, I want to praise you, Lord, and you deserve praise. And the very last verse in, tw in verse 20, blessed be God, because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. And we're going to get there. But what David is doing is the Psalms, he's starting from, I'm going to praise God from what he's done in eternity past and in the history of Israel, and I'm going to end with praising God for what he's done in my life. And again, um, when we're discouraged, when we're frustrated, um, the purpose of this Psalm is to drive us back to the Lord. So we remember what it means to worship the Lord. And this is a, a huge deal. Um, unfortunately, we have come to think that the way you worship is you feel like worshiping first, and then you start doing it. And so we talk about things in terms of, well, boy, I really felt like worshiping the Lord today, and it was great. And what we need to understand is that's not how the Bible teaches us to worship, that we come to worship no matter how we feel, and the feelings will come later. And even if they don't come, we're still going to worship. You think about Job. What Job said is, naked I came from the womb, naked I return, but what? Blessed be the name of the Lord. And even in the middle of the hard times, he turned his mind to worshiping. And by the end of the book, you see his heart turning that way too. And David is the same way. He's turning his mind to worship. This is why the words that we sing in the songs are so important. We were talking just a little while ago about songs we don't sing uh, because the words are not, even though they're in the hymnal, there's something that we've looked at and decided that's, that's not as it ought to be, and so we've decided not to sing it. And I think it's good for us to be very careful about what it is we sing. We bring our mind to the words and then as the words penetrate and we understand what it is that we're, we're singing, then our heart will follow and get in line. So, David starts with three commands. First he says in verse 1, Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. And again, when I think about shouting, the only way I ever shout is if I get overcome. I don't do that on purpose. I'm not typically a shouter for the fun of it. I know people who are, um, but, I, but I'm not. And yet David is saying, come to the Lord and shout. He's not saying, feel like shouting. He's not saying, if you want to. He's giving us a command. Shout to the Lord. Then he goes, shout joyfully to God, and then next, sing the glory of His name. Make His praise glorious. So he goes from shouting to singing his praises. And then verse 3, say to God, how awe-inspiring are your works. And there's a progression there. There's kind of the most vocal and most out there, and then singing a little bit less, and then talking even a little bit more reserved. And again, what I think, as I understand it, is he's taking control of his thoughts. I am going to shout to the Lord because He deserves to be praised. Have you ever been, um, it's kind of interesting, at a football game, when do you shout? When somebody scores, right? When there's a, when there's a good play or a bad play or a bad call, or it's driven by what happens, right? Um, when do cheerleaders shout? Just whenever, right? I mean, they also shout when there's a touchdown, but there's also play, um, specific times where they just stand up and say, it is time to cheer the team. Stand up and cheer the team with us. And, and baseball maybe is a better way of seeing it. You have the seventh inning stretch or times like that that you just pause everything, and the whole group are supposed to do something to say we're excited. 
whether you feel like it or not. And I think, if I understand this right, at least as I was looking at this today and, and being tired and not being excited about some things at UT and just wrestling with different stuff, um, I needed to be told, stop and shout and sing and then say what God has done. And look at the things that he says God has done. How awe-inspiring are your works? Well, that's... We think about that a lot, right? We talk about going to the mountains and seeing the awe-inspiring views of the mountains. Or looking out into space. Man, when I watch, look at the stars at night and imagine their distances and try, oh boy, it's awe-inspiring. But that's not what he's doing. He's talking about how God has destroyed the enemies of the Lord. It's the judgment of God that is making him feel awe. Have you ever been on a, uh, well, I hope you haven't. Have you ever been out on, on the water when there's a big storm is what I was going to say. Uh, boy, you start, I, um, we went deep sea fishing, and when you leave sight of land, when the mainland becomes something you can no longer see, the awe-inspiringness of the ocean is bigger. You know? But you know what's even worse? Is when you're in that place and the waves get big and you realize just how little your life is. It's awe-inspiring in a calm way when you look out and there's not a wave and you can't imagine it's hundreds of feet in all, hundreds of feet down and miles in all directions and you realize just how small you are. But what's really awe-inspiring is when you realize how small your life is compared to the world around you. And that's what David's doing. He's saying, how awe-inspiring on your works are your works. Your enemies cringe before you because of your great strength. Lord, you could bring a hurricane and wipe out a city, and it would be nothing to you. Or you could bring a tsunami and wipe out a city. Or an earthquake. Or if you watch... History Channel, National Geographic, the asteroid. You know, there's a thousand different ways that our world could be over. Millions of people could die because of the strength of the Lord. And David looks to that not because he's afraid, but just to realize how big God is. And there's a lesson for us that it's okay for us. You know, I think one of the panics that happened around the world about COVID has had to be, be about we're not really used to having to be afraid about our mortality. We don't really think we're going to die very easily. So when someone says, there's a virus that any of us could catch at any time and it'll kill, at the beginning they were saying, what, 5% of us or something like that? And we're saying, boy, that's, that's huge. I mean, we're, that's scary. And what are, we all, what are we all waiting for with COVID? What is going to make us feel comfortable? A vaccine. Why? Because we don't want to have to be afraid. We want there to be a solution, problem solution. We can fix it on our own. And I'm not saying a vaccine is bad by any means. I, I hope we find one. What I am saying is this is a good time in your life to look at that and remember God holds your life in his hands. Always. He always has. And just because now you get a glimpse of it a little bit better because of a virus that's around the world, well, maybe this is a good time to stop and praise the Lord. Not because people are sick, but because God is powerful. He's in control. That's what David is doing. He's looking in the eye of the... Job comes back to mind. Do you remember the end of Job? When God actually spoke to Job? How did God speak to Job? Out of what? out of the whirlwind. I don't know about you, I, I want to hear from the Lord in those, in those really dramatic ways, but I don't know that I would have the courage to stand there and watch the tornado approach. And as Job, and you know his life, and you know he's already been saying, Lord, it would have been better for me to just die, I, I, I'm not sure that he didn't want that tornado to go take him out. He's sitting there saying, if if this is what you're going to do to me, do it, Lord. 
and he's staring at that, and it's when he recognized that he had no control that God spoke to him out of the storm. David's teaching us the same thing. So when storms come in our life, we can look right at the heart of the storm and say, yeah, this could take me out. Praise the Lord, because he is bigger than this. Verse 4, because of the strength of the Lord, David is confident that all the earth will worship God. And again, this is a hard thing for us to think about. Um, again, I keep on talking about COVID, but it's, it's around us. Um, in the book of Revelation, we find that in the last days, there will be pestilences that come. And at one point, a quarter of the earth's population will die. This is nothing compared to what that looks like. Nothing. One out of every four worldwide, even the plague in Europe, this, this is bigger than that. And when that happens, there is no way that people will not begin to notice that God is in control. He's going to get their attention. And, and David is actually praising the Lord and saying, all the earth will worship you and sing praise to you. They will sing praise to your name because your enemies will cringe because of your great strength. And then Selah. Let that sink in a minute. <laughs> God is in control. And then what he does next is he begins talking about the positive power of God's work. So, come and see the works of God. His acts toward mankind are awe-inspiring. He turned the sea into dry land, and they crossed the river on foot. There we rejoiced in him. And you know what story he's talking about, right? This is over and over and over again referenced. Um, we have got to have the Exodus clearly in our mind if we're going to understand what the Lord is doing. That's right. This is the crossing of the Red Sea. Here he's the people are surrounded. There is no way out. And there is this guy who looks like, matter of fact, if, if you understood the nature of what it meant to be Pharaoh in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh was God. He was worshipped as God. He was treated as God. And people that had grown up in the land of Egypt had come to believe he was God. And so when they stood with their backs against the Red Sea and this little G God in Pharaoh coming with his armies toward them, it was the end of the world. There's no hope. And it was at that point that the Almighty God stretched out his hand and worked. And he opened up the Red Sea, and they walked through on dry land, praising God that they had been delivered from a false god, and from all the pain and all the, all the torment that had happened. Matter of fact, verse 7 is talking directly to Pharaoh. He rules forever by his might. He keeps his eye on the nations. The rebellious should not exalt themselves. And again... This would be very insulting to the, Egyptian, the Egyptians. I mean, they believe Pharaoh is God. And here comes David telling them that this guy is just a rebellious little kid who's trying to exalt himself. That's, that's the freight, you know, that's, that's how that sounds. He's, he's just a little rebellious. And, and, and those of us that have had kids or you've been around kids, have you ever have you noticed when a kid gets this little rebellious streak in them? And it's cute when they're a year old. It's not so cute when they're 16, but when they're, when they're a year old and they shake their little fist at you and do something, try to run away. My, my parents tell a story about me running away and hiding behind a tree. Um, and the tree was about this big around. And so I, hid, I, had, I could get my eyes hid and that was about it. And they could see the rest of me around it. But to think that a four-year-old could outrun my father, what a silly, silly Silly thought. And the, I think this is exactly what verse 7 is saying, is that when we go rebelling against God, we think we're all great. And these kingdoms and nations that set themselves up against the living God and try to destroy God, they think they're all great. And God looks at them as if they're silly. You're just being 
this little arrogant, rebellious kid. On the other hand, God rules by his might. And so this little Pharaoh who thought he was so big had the arrogance after God had opened up the Red Sea and let a million people walk through on dry land, this, this little guy <laughs> was bold enough to march his army after them and go try to chase them. What silliness. <laughs> and you have to, I mean, we look at it and we laugh and we say, my goodness, look at the walls of water on both sides of you. Don't you know that the God who delivered these people is going to keep delivering them? Like, what are you thinking? But before we get too arrogant about that, I think it also directs it at us. If we're not careful, that's what we do to the Lord. And we shake our little fists at him and say, no, no. And again, just to just keep bringing the, the COVID back up. No, Lord, I'm not going to get sick. I'm, I'm going to take a vaccine or I'm going to do this or I'm going to hide it. I'm not going to do what I'm supposed to do. And again, I, I, I'm not telling anyone to be careless with our lives. I'm just saying that we have to be real careful not to be rebellious. We need to rely on the Lord. I'll tell you, for me, just leave the virus out of it. I think I've told you all this before. Flying in an airplane terrifies the stew out of me. And there's been a time in my life that I really struggled about whether I would obey the Lord if he told me to get on the airplane. What am I thinking? <laughs> the Lord could take my breath like that. There's no difference between that and me riding on an airplane, and yet, and yet we do that. And so David is reminding himself and reminding the rest of us of who God is. God is the God who dries up the Red Sea, and that was good for those who relied on him. And God is the one who brought the Red Sea back on the ones who rebelled against him, and that was bad for them. And then verse 7, Selah again. Let's think about that. Verse 8, praise our God, you peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard. He keeps us alive and does not allow our feet to slip. He saves us. And then verses 10 and 11 and 12 um, are, are what I think are the toughest verses here to understand and, and even to apply. For you, God, tested us. You refined us as silver is refined. We've been talking about this on Sunday mornings quite a bit, how the Lord cares about our faith. Our, pray, our faith is more precious than gold, finally, that, that, which will burn up in a fire. And He desires our faith to shine through. And so He allows us to be put in the test. Matter of fact, this goes so far as to say He tested us. I'm going to come back to that because that's a, that's a deep thought. But he's, he's doing, and, and the, the comfort in this verse is that what is going on is not an accident, it has a purpose. Um, when I'm tired, my, well, Jan will start hollering at me if I go too far. Um, <laughs> um, so we have six children. Um, when it came time for Alana to be born, we wanted really hard to have the baby naturally. Um, actually, it was Kyla that was the, the first one that we wanted. And um, we went in there, and we did the little classes, and I, I taught her how to breathe or whatever that means. No, that's not true at all. We both learned how she's supposed to breathe, right? <laughs> um, and you know, it was very ineffective. She would hurt, and I would say, man, I bet that hurts, and I would, it would make me hurt, and then that made her hurt worse, and it got overwhelming, and it just, it was hard. After that, we found out that you can actually hire someone so I don't have to sit with her during that time. That was a good deal. Um, so we hired a, a doula, and she's someone who had been around a lot of births, knew a lot about it, and she coached Jana through it. 
And what happened is, Jana was able to handle a whole lot more pain than she ever thought she could handle. One of the things that lady said that has stuck with me for a long time is that the thing about birth is it's pain with a purpose. And when you can recognize that the pain that's happening is bringing a baby into the world, and your thoughts are about this new child that's coming, you can endure the pain that you're going through. It helped me immensely. It was much better. <laughs> no, it helped Jana too, and, and she would say that. But, um, but in all seriousness, knowing that the troubles that come in our life have a purpose, that God is using them for our good, that he's building something in us, and he's making us better through it, that's a comfort. It's a comfort when you're frustrated in what's going on and things can't go camping. You try and try and try. But you know, you know that God has a plan. <laughs> you know he does. And so even though you get frustrated with that, and I could think of a thousand other examples of that in my own life, and it should be a comfort to us that God is the one who is testing us, who's refining us. And it even says more. Verse 11, you lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. If you have the King James, it says, you placed burdens on our loins. That's a strong statement. I was trying to, I was trying to understand what that means. I, I think as I understand it, if you have, it means on your very lower back, the burdens on your back, like your lower back, and um, you know, if you get hurt down there, anyway, I, you can put the pieces together. But that's what he's saying. What, he, what he's saying is this is a burden that is so hard you feel like it's going to tear you apart. This is a heavy, heavy burden that God laid on us. Verse 11 is to the Lord. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. Ooh. But again, it started off with verse 10 telling us why. Because we are being refined like silver. Now, some of you might say, well, wait a minute. There are some very clear verses that say that God does not test us. And so when this says God is testing us, what is going on? That's a good question. We ought to consider it. And it's something that I've, I've wrestled with for years. And I'll, I'll share with you a couple places that, to me, are helpful. If you want to write this down, you can look at it later. Um, but a couple, couple passages that look like a contradiction, but they're not. And I think they really help in this passage to understand what's going on. The first one is 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. So if you want to write that down, I'll read you that verse now. And we can, you can look it up later and read it in context. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1, Again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. You remember this story. What happened toward the end of David's life is he decided to take a census, and it was sinful. He should not have done it, and God judged the people because he did it. Okay? But the, the important point, why I bring up this verse right now, is it says, The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them. Okay, whose idea was the census? The Lord's. The Lord's put it in David's mind to number them. That's what 2 Samuel chapter 24 says. Now, 2 Samuel and 1 Chronicles tell a lot of the same story. Okay, so in the original Hebrew, when the books were originally written, 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings, those four books were all part of one giant book. Okay, it's the stories of the prophets. And so Samuel and the prophets after that recorded, and it records the history of the kings from the point of view of the prophets. Okay, 1st and 2nd Chronicles talks about the history of the kings from the point of view of the kings. Okay, so that means First and Second Chronicles are telling a lot of the same stories that Second Samuel and First and Second Kings are. There's a big overlap. Okay, so the same story is told in First Chronicles chapter 21. So if you want to write that down, First Chronicles chapter 21, same event. 
Then Satan stood against Israel and incited David to number Israel. What? And some people that don't believe that the Bible is inspired have used these two verses to say that there's a mistake. Samuel says God incited David to number the people. Chronicles says Satan incited David to number the people. Well, that's a big difference. Was it God or was it Satan? What's the answer? It's my favorite answer. Yes. God allowed Satan to incite Israel. So God is in control. Satan can do nothing without going through the Lord. And yet it was Satan's idea to tempt and test the people. So God allowed Satan. So Samuel is right. God is responsible because God is in control. Chronicles is right as well because it was Satan's idea. Okay. And there's no problem. Like any other, other time, there's a contra apparent contradiction in Scripture. If you, if you do a little bit of thinking, you'll find that there's not a problem at all and never has been. Why do I bring that up? Because when we read passages like this, when, when the Bible tells us, when, Saul, when David is saying, you lured us into a trap, you placed burdens on our backs, some people could look at this and say, boy, that's a mean God. But there's other passages that help us understand this better. Um, keep your finger in Psalm because we're going to come back to it. But turn to James chapter 1. James might have been the verse you were thinking of when we talked about um, can't be tested, that God is not tempted. James chapter 1. And the part that really applies to what we're reading in this portion of the psalm starts in verse 12. So James chapter 1, verse 12. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life which God has promised to those who love him. Notice it's starting off again with saying that God has a plan for the trial. This trial is not an accident. God is using it. But then verse 13 goes on, Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when, has, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So again, we see this things playing together in very um, intricate ways. I don't know how else to say that. It's, it's complicated. So the, the psalmist, David, is telling us that we are lured, in, that the Lord lured us into a trap. But James goes on to say, well, wait a minute. Steadfast trials develops your perseverance. And that's a good thing. Stand up under the trial and you'll receive a crown of life. This is from the Lord as a blessing for you. But by the way, when you're lured, you're lured because of your own desire. Okay, let me try to explain it with the garden. When we look at the very first sin, we see a pattern of all the other sins to come. On the one hand, Satan was allowed by the Lord to be in the garden. Many people, you might have asked that. Why in the world, Lord, did you not just take the snake out of the garden? We wouldn't be in all this mess. And so in a sense, the Lord allowed Eve to be tested because he could have removed the serpent. And he left the serpent on purpose. Okay? On the other hand, Satan lured Eve Right? He's the one who said, you will not surely die. He's the one who lured her. On the other hand, when Eve fell, the Bible says she looked at the fruit and saw that it was appealing. It appealed to her senses, and her desires caused her to sin. So in that one event, we see God allowing the test, Satan having an influence over the test, and yet the responsibility is still on Eve because she fell for it. She gave in to her own desires. And so I'm saying all that because when we read passages like this in the Psalms, we can get all swirled around. Well, Lord, what are you doing to us? Why are you? No, we're doing it to ourselves. Yeah, the Lord cares about our sanctification, and he allows us to go through the test. 
But as, he go, as we go through the test, we're lured by our own desires into the trap. And we get put ourselves under the heavy burden. And so it, if you want to turn back to Psalms, we'll be there the rest of the night. Psalm chapter 66. You lured us into a trap. You placed burdens on our back. The burdens were our own fault. It's the burden of sin. And it happened because we chose that. Yeah, the Lord allowed it, but we chose that. Verse 12, you let men ride over our heads. That was a consequence for the sin. We sin, God allows judgment, or God brings judgment. But verse 12 goes on to say, we went through fire and water, but you brought us out to abundance. This is again, I think, talking about the deliverance of the people from, from Israel. On the one hand, they uh, walked through the water on the Red Sea, parted the sea, and they walked through the water. On the other hand, there is the, pa the, the um, pillar of fire, the cloud um, that was there. They walked through, they, they got to be near that presence. And so they walked through the fire and the water that night as they saw the fire and walked through the water. And they came out eventually to the land of Canaan. They were brought to the land of abundance. And again, the picture is for us is that when there are trials in our lives and things that are hard, God will work deliverance for us. Yeah, there are tough trials. And sometimes because of our own foolishness and our own desires, we get caught in a net and we get punished because of our own sins and we get all swirled around. And God brings us through through fire and water, to great abundance. And so, verse 13 turns into praise to the Lord. I will enter your house with burnt offerings. I will pay you my vows that my lips promised and my mouth spoke during my distress. I will offer you fatted sheep as burnt offerings with the fragrant smoke of rams. I sacrifice oxen and goats. Selah. What he's saying here is, I will worship you. Now, verses 1 through 4 was talking about worshiping with our mouths. This is talking about worshiping with our feet, with our actions. That it doesn't stop on our lips, but it moves to our hands and the things that we do. And David is saying, Lord, you have delivered me from the power of evil because I have been brought through I'm going to do something about it. I'm not just going to be talking about it. I'm going to do something about it. And so we see in the Old Testament, the way you did something about it was sacrificing. So I'm coming to your house and I'm bringing burnt offerings. I'm fulfilling the vows that I've made to you. I am giving you fat and fatted sheep and rams and I will sacrifice oxen and goats. I'm bringing that to you. And, and again, uh, that's why Romans tells us in chapter 12 that, um, that uh, we, we are a living sacrifice. We're to offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. That whole sacrificial idea is that we will worship not with our mouths alone, but with, our, with all of us. With our, our, and again, don't think that David was saying, I'm going to save myself because I'm going to cover a little blood and now you can't hurt me, God. What he's saying is, God, you brought me through fire and water, and so this is my expression of my worship to you. I want to do something, and you've given me a way to do something. And then the psalm finishes in the last um, five verses. Come and listen, all who fear God, and I will tell what he has done for me. There's a change there. Look back through the Psalms, through this Psalm. Um, the, first, uh, the first seven verses, God is, or the, 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 uh, David is talking to people. And then verses 8 through um, 12, he's talking to the Lord, and it's about you, and it's about us. But then verse 13, the change happens. Now he's saying, I will worship. It's gone from just recognizing this is something we ought to do. I'm telling you all guys, all of you, you ought to do it. 
Lord, thank you for all you, what you've done for us. And now it's turned into, I am so thankful. And so verse 16, come and listen, all who fear the Lord, and I will tell you. Now I, I, I can't, I'm not going to let everyone else do it on my behalf. I want to tell the world what Jesus has done for me or what the Lord has done for me. Verse 17, I cried out to him with my mouth and praise was on my tongue. If I had been aware of malice in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. However, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. Now this is the heart of the matter, going back to thinking about being out on the ocean with storms around us. You think of the awesome nature of who God is, his bigness, the way that we could we could die. And I'll tell you again, riding an airplane, when we get to the, about the 200 foot mark and I realize it is out of my hands. I don't know why I think it's in my hands on the runway, but something about when the ground disappears, it is out of my hands. There's a surrender that happens. And I start realizing just how little we are, this little speck of metal way up there in the sky, this great big old distance between us and this huge land down below. And it's at that time that I realize, or I should realize, that the God who made this huge land, that made the oceans with all of their power and splendor, that very God is the one who listens when I pray. What David did is he started out saying, God is a God who judges the earth. He can take an ocean and separate it and make it, in. he can destroy kings and nations. And what he ends with saying, that very God listens to what I have to say. He hears my prayer. And that's why he's praising at the end of the psalm. He's, he's saying, um, come and listen, all you who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for me. I cried out to him with my mouth. Verse 19, God has listened. He has paid attention to the sound of my prayer. May God be praised. He has not turned away from my prayer. And I believe that's the, at least that was the lesson for me today. Like I said, I, I read some emails last night that kind of had me frustrated about things that I have to do at UT. And, 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 and quite frankly, what happens is I start saying, I'm in control of my schedule and I don't like this and I better kick every direction I can to make things work the way I want them to work. And as I studied this, this was an encouragement to me today to say, you know, you're not so big, number one. <laughs> and, and we need to be reminded, I need to be reminded of that often. God is in control. Nobody slipped something over on him. He can judge the world at any time. And the very God who flooded the entire world because of his judgment and who will one day flood it again with fire in judgment, that very God hears our cry. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> so as we come, this is perfect. That This is the time now that we come to the Lord. Oh my goodness, how bold we ought to be we say, this is what I want to pray to the Lord about because he hears my cry. We have folks that are going through cancer. We need to remember, there's several going through tough times. We need to remember Mary. She's mourning the loss of her husband. And it's dark times. And I'm not saying life is easy. It is not easy. But know this, God hears us. <laughs> Our prayers matter. And through it all, he shows his steadfast love. May God be praised. He has not turned away my prayer or turned his faithful love from me. Even in the hard times. So let's spend some time. I, I, want to, I want to take a few minutes just to take, 
take names um, for who we need to be praying for. So 